to uh, switch a little bit in this uh, in this track, and we're going to talk about what it actually means to um, engagement with with customers. And uh, I'm very pleased to to have uh, Sid Suri, uh, the head of marketing at Sendbird, uh, to talk about uh, a topic that is uh, is becoming very important um, for fintechs as well as any startups uh, to think about how they're actually going to become more social. Uh, so, Sid, can I just ask you to um, share your screen a moment to make sure that uh, everything's working fine? Uh, absolutely. Let me go and do that. Everything looking okay, John? That's perfect. I'm going to leave you to it. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here with you today. My name is Sid Suri, and I'm the head of marketing for Sendbird. I will tell you all about Sendbird later. Let's just get straight into the content. Um, I'm going to talk about the rise of social plus apps and this trend we're seeing in, this mar in the market of apps becoming more and more social. And especially, I'm going to talk about fintechs and payment apps becoming more social and why this trend is really not a choice, but an imperative, and what this means for fintechs and how it's really transforming them for the better. So that's a little bit about what I'm going to go through, and then I'll end it with just a little bit about who Sendbird is. Um, so let's talk about some trends in messengers and payments first. These are some of the largest messenger apps. I really should say messenger monopolies in the world because there are not that many of them, and they all look familiar. And I, I read a stat the other day, 6 billion people now talk on a messenger app every month. 6 billion people. That's a staggering number. I mean, 6 billion people in the world don't agree on anything. They don't, you know, they don't speak the same language. They don't worship the same religion. But 6 billion people use a messenger app. So that's just gives you a sense of scale and popularity of the modern messenger apps today. And you know, over time, now in 2021, these apps do a lot more than just send messages, right? I mean, sending messages seems so 20 years ago. Now these apps help you order from restaurants. These apps help you get a food delivery. These apps help you send a payment. These apps have games inside of them. Um, you know, WeChat has really led the way of this. You can pay your utility bills. You can share your location with a friend. Uh, the, the things you can do is almost endless inside of um, these, these, these messenger apps. And again, they have such massive adoption. And one area they've really got into quite aggressively is payments, probably because it's one of the most profitable places to be. And if you look at what uh, at the messenger apps that have really expanded into payments, here's just some few examples. You know, Line BK in Thailand advertises itself as the first social banking platform, right? It's a messenger app that's really gone hard into the fintech world. You can now apply for loans inside of Line BK. You can again pay your utilities, pay your friends. WhatsApp, which is incredibly popular in India and and around the world, but India, I believe, is one of their biggest markets, um, introduced payments there first, and we're, I'm sure it'll follow suit in. Um, lots of different other countries, right? So now within WhatsApp, I'm talking to a friend. Hey, I owe you money, 10 bucks, great. You know, here you go, thank you so much, um, and so on and so forth. And Facebook Messenger has done the same in, um, in the US. And what these apps are basically doing is they're betting on the fact that you're already in there, your friends are already in there, and you'll use them to make a payment rather than a traditional payment app like PayPal or uh, Square or any of the pure play fintechs. Um, so what does this mean for fintechs? This is pretty scary for all those payment apps that um, you know, both old ones and new ones that have sprung up over the last you know, 20, 25 years of uh, the modern internet. And uh, you know, does this mean that if social messenger apps have adopted payments, that payment apps now have to become social? I think the answer is yes. But before we get deeper into that, I want to talk a little bit about this trend, not just in fintechs, but across all apps. Um, and it's really the rise of what we're calling social plus apps. I didn't coin this term. 
Um, this term has been around. I, I, I'm not sure if the um, Andreessen Horowitz A16 blog coined it, but that's where I read about it first. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is just a term being used to define uh, a class of apps called Social Plus. So let's really define this first. What is a Social Plus app? A Social Plus app merges a strong social layer. So what is a social layer? Chat, voice, video, basically the ability for users to interact in either a one-on-one -on -one or a group setting and uses that to build a community all within the utility of the application. So it doesn't mean that there it's social media, right? The entire purpose of the app is not um, to be social. The app still has a purpose, but social is a key layer inside of it. Let's look at some examples um, and I'll come back to why I become a social plus app. I'm just gonna start with some of the non-FinTech ones in the bottom row. If you look at Strava, what is Strava? Strava is a fitness community and app, right? It's essentially a way to track your fitness, achieve your fitness goals. But why people love Strava is the power of the community. You can, you know, there've been fitness tracking apps forever. Um, but the reason Strava has become really popular is it's built a really strong community. I think Peloton is the same way. Peloton, which has become so popular around the, um, and you know their stock's been doing crazy um, things, is is really not just the bike, but the power of the community. If you look at Pinduoduo, you know it's basically a social commerce app. You know if you look at some of the fintechs, Venmo actually started social payments a long time ago, and has become immensely popular. And we'll talk more about that. But there's other fintechs now becoming social as well. Social investing with Common Stock, Public, social savings with Stokefella in South Africa, which is very popular. So all these apps are becoming, um, are layering a strong social and community component to the utility of the app. So why become a social plus app? Um, well, for one, if you build a community, that's gonna drive word of mouth and growth. You know, two, network effects keeps competition out, right? So now if you wanna compete with a Strava, it's not as simple as fitness tracking, which you know a bunch of developers could code up in a month, but you have to build this incredibly loyal and passionate community, which is very hard to do. Um, customers stay because of the community. And then, you know, as every brand wants, you have an opportunity to monetize the community. Um, so that's why we see this huge trend of apps becoming social apps, even though the utility of the app might be something like fitness or whatever it might be, right? And social features, it's really win-win because it can make payment apps more fun and increase retention. And that's what the likes of WhatsApp are counting on. If you think about payments, they are inherently social by nature, right? What is a payment? A payment is two people sending money between them. It is a social interaction that involves money. And what are some typical examples? Well, you send and receive money with friends. Usually there's a conversation around that, right? Like the money just doesn't appear one day. It's like, hey, Ted, I, hey, John, I owe you 15 bucks for that lunch. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, it was actually only 12. Okay, here you go. Perfect. I got it. Thanks so much. Let's connect again sometime, right? It's a social interaction with a payment inside of it. And that's why the messenger apps are counting on. So the, so for the, so, for the payment apps to become social, it makes perfect sense because payments are inherently social. Um, you may want to split a bill amongst friends. You go out for dinner, you go out for a movie, and now you need to coordinate between five people on who owes what. Um, you may want to reply. You may want to thank the person. You may, if it's a vendor, you want to build a relationship. You know, the plumber comes and, um, and, 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 and helps you with your, uh, with, your, with your clogged bathroom issue, maybe not the most pleasant example. And then, you know, they, they message you, hey, and, hey, it's $120 for the job, and you pay them, and they thank you, and then they maybe give you a coupon, they ask you to leave a review. It now becomes a very social and relationship-building transaction. Um, and that's the future and the power of social combined with payments that I think payment, app, payment apps are now acknowledging and latching onto. Um, and like I said, you know, once you build a community, once you get all these users in there talking, you have an opportunity to monetize the community, right? And, um, you know, there's, I mean, 
you don't need to hear it from me, right? Like there's so many ideas and so many tried and tested models of how to monetize a community. You can give brands access to your community through promotions and announcements and coupons. You can have social shopping use cases. This has become really big with China leading the way. Um, I gave the Pinduoduo example. You can create live commerce experiences where you have a live stream to the community with an influencer talking about a product, right? So, you know, once you have that strong, passionate community, selling the community things um, uh, usually follow suit. And there's a lot of tested models for that. Um, and then a social fingerprint can reduce fraud. So if I'm on there and I'm, you know, the way I chat, the way I interact, the words I use, the time of day I interact, the location I use from the app, it just gives more of a fingerprint inside of the app. So I become harder to impersonate. It's not as simple as uh, stealing a login or hacking a hacking an account. Um, so having a social presence or encouraging and facilitating your users to have a social presence inside of your app can actually help uh, reduce fraud, increase the fingerprint. Um, so that's that's another sort of secondary benefit. But you know, let's look at some apps that are leading the way on this. Paytm, which is the largest largest um, uh, payment app in India, is uh, building a social payments platform on top of their app. Um, so it's not just again about paying one user to another, but shopping, promotions, splitting bills, having a conversation, sharing your location. They're building a a very powerful um, a very powerful social app. Uh, in, built on top of a payments platform. PicPay in Brazil is doing something very similar. Again, live commerce, user profiles, friends lists, all of the things that you would never associate with a payment app are now happening inside of payments. And again, to counter the threat of people like WhatsApp. Um, PayPay in Japan is doing the same thing. So these are just some of the big companies um, that are leading their markets with uh, both they're the you know they're one of either the largest or one of the largest payment platforms, but also leading with innovation. Um, and of course, by coincidence, they're all Sendbird customers. Of course, they are. Otherwise, I would be showing you different examples. So a little bit about who we are. We are helping apps become social. We are helping every app become a social plus app. Not just fintechs, not just healthcare apps, not just e-commerce apps, education, entertainment, you name it. Every app. All of these mobile apps that now run our lives are becoming more and more social, and that's what Sendbird helps them do. Um, our mission is to help build connections and relationships in a digital world. And we do that by connecting people over chat, voice, and video inside of mobile apps. Um, we are a, a mobile user engagement platform, and we help make apps more social and more engaging. So this could be powering user-to-user -user relationships in one-on-one -on -one chat or voice or video. We have a lot of community apps um, like Reddit. Uh, we have a lot of dating apps like Hinge. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of apps where you would think relationships are built. Um, but we have a lot of apps that also are more centered around transactions. So we have a lot of uh, apps that use Sendbird in, in, for e-commerce to connect buyers and sellers, right? Buying, buying is an inherently a very social process. Yet a lot of the first generation of the internet e-commerce apps, including Amazon till this very day, are very transactional and very cold and very impersonal in nature. But when you think about buying, it's a conversation. Hey, I'm interested in this cashmere sweater you're selling. Oh, oh, great. You know, what can I tell you? Um, are you is it 100% cashmere? Uh, yes, it is. Can you take a picture of the label and send it to me? Sure thing, no problem. Great, can I get a discount? Sure, I can offer you 10% off. Perfect, thank you. Will it ship by tomorrow? Yes, it will, right? It's a, it's a conversation, right? Transactions happen via a conversation. And that's, um, and a lot of these transactional apps, e-commerce, healthcare, um, uh, ride sharing, food delivery, um, are all building in a strong social layer into their apps to facilitate those transactions and that's a big part of what we do. Um, we have three primary products, Sendbird Chat, Sendbird Calls, which is our voice and video product. So those of you who are familiar with what Agora does, it's essentially a competitor to Agora. And then Sendbird Desk, which is a, a customer support chat product. 
Um, so sender chat is user to user and large group chat and open channel chat, which is for live streams. Sender calls is again one to one and group audio and video. And sender desk is specifically for customer support. All of those three products sit on top of the Sendberg platform, um, where we have 150 month, uh, million monthly active users uh, talking. So uh, I don't know this for a fact, but I estimate that we are the largest chat platform you've never heard of. We are a white label platform. We sit invisible inside of the apps. So you could be using um, Carousel in Singapore and talking to a seller um, over a painting you want to buy, and you'll actually be talking at on Sendbird because Carousel is a Sendbird customer. You would never know it, but the Carousel team, instead of building the chat feature, uh, acquired it from Sendbird, and our platform sits underneath, invisible, and made available to the user via an API and completely branded by Carousel or whichever customer it is. So we are the largest white label, sort of invisible chat platform that you've never heard of. Hopefully, you've heard of us now. Um, and of course, you can't service that scale and the kinds of customers we do without being incredibly reliable and secure. We have some of the largest um, apps in across industries as our customers. And again, um, you know these are sort of the the innovators of every category. Um, you know, Delivery Hero, the largest food delivery company in Europe iFood in Brazil, Kareem in the Middle East, we're huge in the ride sharing and delivery space. Obviously payments, I talked about some of those examples already. Communities, uh, casual gaming, fantasy sports, dating, um, lots of marketplaces. That's one of our biggest vertical, Carousel, uh, Shipstead in the Nordics, Rakuten in Japan, Dubizel in the Middle East. Um, lots of healthcare, lots of doctor to patient interactions. You know, about two years ago, we saw a big rise in sort of social healthcare a lot of virtual interactions, um, Teladoc being one of the biggest headspace for um, telemental wellness, coaching, mentoring, um, Doc Planner, one of the biggest uh, telehealth in uh, Europe and Latin America. So uh, apps across industries building in very strong social and community features, chat, voice, and video into their apps to engage their users uh, facilitate transactions between users and retain them. Um, that's all. That's that's uh, that's uh, a little bit about uh, this this trend in social apps that we're seeing, especially in fintechs. And uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sid. So I have um, I have some some questions that um, very very useful examples that you brought up, um, but I noticed that many of those. Actually, most of those are uh, uh, born digital companies. And I guess if you're a, a born digital company, it's, it's very easy to, to think, OK, I, I, I don't want to build everything myself. I'm going to take um, different building blocks. And sure. this is what we talk a lot about um, at API Days, about the, the partner ecosystem and how you assemble um, your, your entire um, how you address your entire customer journey using using those building blocks, but in in this current environment, a lot of traditional firms are realizing if we if we thought we needed to be digital before, now we know, and um, they they're coming off a, a lower base. They they've suddenly realized they need to have an e-commerce website. They probably need to start engaging. If they didn't have a mailing list before. Now all of a sudden they need one. Um, what are the sorts of uh, steps? I mean, what, some of the examples you've shown are really great uh, success stories. But for a company that's just starting the journey, sure. what are the what are the different pieces you think that they need to start with in order to start on that that journey of becoming more of a, a social app? Yeah, I think it's all about the use case, right? The use case drives the uh, drives everything. So if you're a traditional bank what's up, um, and you have a digital arm and you're trying to offer online banking, initially, you're just happy to get like a basic online banking app out. Um, so you can compete with a lot of the more modern challenger banks and other pure plays. Um, but over time, your users are always going to pull you towards more innovation because they get it from somewhere else. 
right? So if you're a uh, online banking, you know, you might, your users might want to start connecting with each other to talk about, uh, to talk about savings ideas. If you are a retailer and you've just gotten your online marketplace up and you're really excited that you've got your online marketplace up, um, you know, next thing you know, you're, you'll get an angry email from a customer who says, Hey, you know, when I try to contact you, it takes forever and I have to use email and I have to pick up the phone. Why can't I chat with you? Um, I'm able to do that on eBay or I'm able to do that on carousel. So I think the use case ends up driving where a lot of these traditional industries will end up going. But what ends up happening is the customers pull them in that direction and the customers get that experience from elsewhere and customers are brutal, right? They're not going to sit around and say, well, you're an older company. You've been around a hundred years. I'll give you some more time. Right. It's like, Hey, if I can chat with my, um, customer support person on carousel, why can't I chat with you? Right. So I think, you know, let the use cases drive it, listen to your customers, see what they're saying, what they're asking for, and then just build slowly, I guess, you know, have a project, set reasonable expectations, you know, figure out uh, um, how you can how you can sort of build incrementally. You know, a good part of what we do, Sendbird, and I'm sure a lot of other API companies as well, is we really spend a lot of time to make it easy to do what we, to to bring in our product, right? So, not to be too much of a Sendbird commercial, but you know, you can get the UI, you can get all the functionality wrapped inside of the UI. And you can get that pulled into your app with a few lines of code, literally a few lines of code. Now you still have to put the project around it, the process, the workflow. You still have to figure out how it makes sense for your business. But that means being a savvy business person, not being a savvy technologist, right? So we can sort of do the technology for you. Yeah. So as you were explaining that, I was thinking um, it comes down to listening to your customers because customers may be screaming, "Hey, I." I need you to um, interact with me this way. But if the, the company is not listening, then that and they feel, well, what was successful in the past will, will also be successful yeah. in the future, then then they're going to ignore that. So um, the traditional companies have a big advantage in that they they have already a, a large customer base that just um, haven't necessarily engaged with them um, uh, in as uh, in, in a real-time uh, interactive fashion, and uh, I, I guess they have to run. I, I think you right. you talked about running experiments to see what works. Uh, yeah, take, and you know, taking don't, stages. Don't chase technology for technology's sake, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're like, hey, we need a chat app. Well, are your customers asking for it? Or we need a, you know, we need to use the AI somehow so I can tell my CEO we're now AI enabled, right? Like you know if. if I feel like that's where technology projects always go long, go wrong, where there's not a strong business case and not a strong customer pull. Um, you know, most so many projects fail, and this stuff is hard enough. So if you don't have that strong sense of demand, you know, things can go off. Um, so, but but I think the good news is, you know, all the API companies are making the technology easier, right? You know, we actually have an easier time selling to some of those more traditional industries than a lot of the modern, uh, more recent sort of mobile first, digital first unicorns and startups because those companies have very strong engineering orgs who just want to do everything themselves, right? You go sell to a DoorDash or a Delivery Hero or a Paytm, you know, they're going to be like, we've got hundreds of engineers. We do this every day. We have built platforms that are worth tens of billions of dollars. Why do we need you? Um, we'll build it ourselves. And then, you know, we have to go through a, a process to help educate them on the value of an API and why they don't want to spend the time and resources to rebuild and recreate what is a solved problem. But a lot of the more traditional industries are like, oh, we don't want any part of doing this ourselves. We're so happy you're here and we're so happy that you've made this easy for us. So it sort of goes both ways. Mm -hmm. Well, and I guess you, you also need to address um, customer data privacy. So it still needs to be consent based uh, communication interaction. You still need to take account of your customer's preferences. You don't just push uh, a new method of communication uh, to them. Yeah. You you ask them, uh, they, they may have asked you for it, um, 
but if they haven't, uh, if, even if they have, you still want to gain their permission, you have to, get um, the permission. To, yep. to communicate that that way. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sid, for, for those insights. I appreciate yep. it. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.